They were one of the most notorious street gangs in Canada, and their founder and leader became one of Canada's most wanted men. Danny Wolf and the Indian Posse menaced communities even as they offered a surrogate family for Indigenous youth whose parents struggled with trauma and addiction after years in the residential school system. Joining us now to help understand the complexity of a kingpin and his realm in Regina, Saskatchewan, Susan Creeley. She is Danny Wolf's mother. And here in studio, Joe Friesen, author of The Ballad of Danny Wolf. He's also demographics reporter at The Globe and Mail. Susan and Regina, Joe here in Toronto, it's great to have both of you on our program tonight for what will be, I think, um, at times a very difficult conversation. This is a heartbreaking story in so many ways. Joe, I'll ask you to start us off by just telling us to describe the childhood that Richard and Danny Wolf had. Danny was born in Regina in 1976. Um, he was born into a fairly difficult situation. His mother, Susan, uh, was struggling with alcoholism at the time, and uh, Danny was in and out of her care for most of his early life. Um, the family moved to Winnipeg when he was about four years old, and it was in Winnipeg that he went to school, where teachers described him as a very quiet and watchful child. Um, bright, though. Extremely bright. Mm -hmm. um, guy who um, very early on showed some of the signs that he might eventually become something um, you know, notable, I think, in, uh, in his community. Susan, let me ask you, I know that these are hard questions to deal with all these years later, but, but let's try anyway. How much did your personal difficulties prevent you from being the kind of mother to your boys that you wanted to be? Well, I wasn't, um, I was raised in residential school and I didn't have any parenting skills of raising any, any child. And I just, um, did the best I could. So the residential school, well, your, your, I guess your parents were in residential schools as well as you, right? Yes, my parents too. So how much did that, if I can just use this expression, how much did that mess you up? Uh, terribly. Alcoholism as well? Uh, alcoholism and violence, violence in the home. If I may ask, and forgive me if it's too personal, how are you currently handling your addictions? My addiction, I, I don't use anymore, use drugs or alcohol. I put myself into treatment and I, um, I sobered up. So you're a much healthier person today? Oh, yes. We're happy to hear that. Let me share uh, some rather grave statistics that I'm sure you two both know all too well. We'll share these with our audience. In 2011, Aboriginal children in this country, 14 years and under, represented just 7%, 7 of all children in Canada, and yet they accounted for 48% of all foster children in the country, 87% of all foster children aged 14 and under in Canada, in Saskatchewan rather, were Aboriginal. The number is 85% in Manitoba, 73% in Alberta, and more than half in British Columbia. This past January, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal ruled that the federal government discriminated against First Nations children by underfunding welfare services on reserves, the results of underfunding being that many First Nations children are put into foster care. Uh, Joe, I think we need some better understanding of why this happens. Why so many Indigenous kids in foster care? Well, I think the first place you start is the legacy of the residential schools. The, the intergenerational trauma that was caused by that historic period is just unfathomable. Um, one of the things I was trying to do in this book is to look at one family in particular just to, to really drill down and to, to see how it would impact the life of someone like Danny Wolf. Now you take his mother, she grew up in a home where she knew her father and mother only sporadically because she was taken away at the age of six and placed in a residential school. Me several. Different Se ones, yeah. in different places. Two different residential schools. Mm -hmm. And in those schools she suffered both physical and sexual abuse. Uh, so that by the time she was 12 and had run away from those schools, she was turning to alcohol and drugs to numb the pain that she suffered. Um, but it doesn't just end with her generation. You have to go back even further. Her father was in the residential schools and his father was in the residential schools, um, going back all the way to the turn of the 20th century. So if you look at the impact that's had across you know, three generations of one family. It's pretty substantial. So if you wanted to go out of your way to make a family as dysfunctional as humanly possible, that's what happened here. That's a pretty good explanation, yep. 
Susan, you had to give up actually three of your children. Uh, Danny and Richard were placed in foster care for a time. Uh, how traumatic was that for you, having to do that? Um, giving up my three children, I think I, I thought at the time was best for them because I couldn't look after them. I didn't have any, I wasn't working or nothing, and I was using a lot and that I just wasn't caring, caring for them. And I left them a lot just to go party and that. So I just, it was heartbreaking, but I had to do it. And their father was not in their life either, right? No. No, he wasn't. What was his story? Uh, well, him too, he grew up in residential school. Hmm. And him, I don't know the history of what happened to him in residential school, but he, him too, he was a, use, using drugs and alcohol, and he passed away, though. He passed away a um, couple of years ago. And the boys barely knew him, right? Uh, the boys didn't know him, just knew him by his name and carried his name. And... No, they didn't know him at all. Hmm. Let's do a quote from Joe's book here. Uh, here we go, from the Ballad of Danny Wolf. One woman who was there in the early days said Danny dreamed of giving all the kids who had been messed up by their parents a home base, a chance to have something in life, and a way to learn to make money and feed themselves. She said she and many others had no structure, no sense of purpose, no home, but Danny provided those things for them, molding them into a unit and showing them a life that was both terrifying and exhilarating. Joe, you're talking about the Indian Posse here, I gather. Mm -hmm. This is the, oh, you call it in some respects, a family unit uh, that the Wolf Brothers set up uh, from the time they were early teenagers, right? What was the terrifying and what was the exhilarating? Well, the Indian Posse is extraordinary because it was formed by these kids when, when they were just 12 years old. Richard, at 12, Dan, uh, Richard 13, Danny 12. Um, the terrifying was that they became a criminal force in the city of Winnipeg. They were uh, doing drive-by shootings. They were running drugs. They were uh, doing prostitution. Um, Let's the, get this straight. These are 13-year-old kids who are running a prostitution ring, who yes. are drive-by shooting, who are walk-by shootings, too. That's right. Yeah, walk-by shootings was Danny's uh, specialty. He, he thought the drive-by was uh, too soft. Uh, the walk-by showed a lot more bravery, in his view. Um, no, it's extraordinary the, the, the kind of crimes they were committing. Uh, armed robberies, you name it, they were getting into it at a very early age. And that was the terrifying. What was the exhilarating? The exhilarating, I think, for them was the, the feeling of, of power, of, of, of pride that they got in being part of something that was getting a lot of attention in the media as people grew more and more concerned about this kind of gang crime. And as the name Indian Posse started to uh, become sort of renowned in the city, they felt like they were, they were part of something bigger than themselves, and they took a lot of pride in that. Susan, I know you were sort of barely functional at this time. You had so many problems in your own life, but were you aware of the Indian Posse and the role that your two sons played in creating it? Uh, no, I wasn't aware of it. And when you found out what they were up to, was there anything you could do about it? Uh, no, there was nothing I could do about it because I, uh, they were just out of control. Hmm. Joe, in 1992, Winnipeg police say they knew of only one youth street gang. A year later, they could name 18. You're from Winnipeg. How did that happen? Gangs were kind of going through a moment in popular culture at the time where they, they became something that everyone was interested in. In, in music, uh, there was the gangster rap movement that kind of, a lot of the topics they discussed revolved around street gangs. In movies, you had films like Boys in the Hood uh, that, that sort of glorified the street gang life. And, and in Winnipeg, you had a population that, that particularly among indigenous people, suffered from a great deal of entrenched poverty uh, that, that saw not much hope for themselves, I think, in, among the young people. And, and the street gangs became a way for them to, to act out and to, to rebel against the system. In spite of all of the criminal activity they were involved in, why did this Indian Posse almost resemble a family for them? Well, they were coming from families in many cases that were, that were broken. And Danny's story, although it's remarkable, um, for, for some of the tragedies that, that marked his early life was not uncommon, unfortunately. A lot of his friends uh, also came from homes where you know, one or two parents suffered from addictions, uh, where they might have been sent to foster care very early on, uh, and they were running away from that kind of life. 
and running towards something that they thought uh, would provide them a sense of independence and that family that they, they, they were really searching for. Hmm. Here we go with another excerpt from the Ballad of Danny Wolf. The Indian Posse represented a violent rejection of Canadian society at the same time as it emphasized native spirituality, however superficially, meetings, especially in prison, included smudging to cleanse the spirit. That combination of transgression and spirituality had a powerful impact on those looking for an identity and sense of purpose. Indigenous blood was a requirement of membership and people of other ethnicities were banned. Uh, again, Joe, help us understand what was it in particular about Canadian society in the early 1990s that these indigenous folks were trying to rebel against? Well, if you remember, that was a time of a very heightened political tension in Canada because um, there were a number of incidents. I think 1988 in Winnipeg, there was a shooting of a native leader named J.J. Harper mm -hmm. that had a very important impact on the birth of the Indian Posse, I think. It wasn't too, much, too far, too, too many months later that we had the Oka crisis in Quebec that brought mm -hmm. indigenous people and a mainstream white society into conflict in a way that you know, dominated the headlines for months. Well, the it Canadian forces were there and guns drawn and it was, I remember it, it was violent. Yeah, and it was dramatic and mm -hmm. everyone was paying attention. And I think for, for teenage boys, seeing this environment, um, there was a sense that they wanted to reclaim uh, a sense of their identity and heritage and, and to fight back against a society that was offering them mm -hmm. very little. So Susan, was the Indian Posse in some respects a source of pride for indigenous people in Winnipeg at the time? That, uh, that I don't know, because, um, like, like I said, my, my brain was all fogged up from drugs and alcohol, and I really wasn't paying attention to what they were doing and, or what was happening around me. So you were really never in a position then to pull your boys aside and say, I, I'm, I've heard what you're up to, now cut this out. You couldn't do that. Is that right? Uh, no, no, I couldn't do that. Hmm. Was there anybody else there who was able to give you help at that time? No, I had no support of any kind. I had a lot of drinking friends, but so-called friends, but that wasn't any kind of support for me. So your boys really had rule of the roost, as it were. They could do pretty much yep. whatever they wanted. Yep. Hmm. This is a pretty toxic mix, isn't it, Joe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, from about the age of 13 or 14, these boys, or even earlier perhaps, were fending for themselves on the streets. They were renting apartments on their own that they were turning into drug houses. Uh, they were acquiring weapons. Richard uh, had an AK-47. He once took a gun to school, for which he got in serious trouble. Um, there, there was a lot of bad stuff going on. Now, we're talking about Winnipeg, the city, but w I mean, there's obviously plenty of remote uh, Aboriginal reserves in Manitoba. Uh, did the Indian Posse operate on those as well? Yeah, very soon after the Indian Posse formed, it started to grow quickly, much more quickly than, than anyone involved ever anticipated. And a lot of that growth came through family networks. So if you had a cousin on the reserve, he would bring the idea back to the reserve. And without a leader even visiting some of these places, the Indian Posse would, would suddenly have a chapter in, uh, in a far off remote reserve. And it was like that across the prairies. As the years went on, more and more uh, Indian Posse members were signing up to the point that it became a very large street gang. And there were, there were moments when Danny had to show that he was in charge, right? What did he do to some of the fellow members of his group in order to prove that? Well, the, probably the most notable moment for Danny was uh, when he was in Fort Capel in 2007. Um, he was at a bar and someone from a rival gang uh, saw his tattoos and knew he was an Indian Posse member but didn't realize how significant an Indian Posse member this was and started to pick a fight with him in the bar. And Danny could not allow an incident like that to go unchallenged. So he uh, got a couple other guys, he tracked down that person, found the house where they were partying that night, and he and the others stormed in with their guns blazing and shot everyone in the house in a uh, sort of shocking, cold-blooded act that left two people dead and three people injured. Susan, it's a strange question to ask a mother about her children but since you've established for us that you were kind of not there for much of their childhood, um, how would you describe your son? How, how well did you know him? Well, when, um, when he was very little, he, um, he was about, uh, let's say about three months, two months. He was, um, he just about passed away. And um, he was in a hospital for a long time. 
and then uh, I got him, I took him out, and in our, in our traditional way, um, my dad the, um, done spiritual stuff with him, and, and he was okay after. Hmm. And, and growing up, he was, um, his dad took him away from me and took him to Prince Albert, and that's where he lived till he was about nine months or even more. As I don't remember, I can't even, like, the ages of when my, his dad took him away. But I know that he was talking when he come back to me. Hmm. I, I gather his traditional name was Come Up Shouting at Earth. How, yeah. did, how did he get that name? Uh, through a uh, ceremony. But why did you call him that? Uh, it wasn't me that gave him that. It was um, our Muslim and Kukums. I see. And that described him well, I gather. Yes, that's what they, they saw in him, I guess. That's why they named him that. He, Joe, eventually goes to the Regina Provincial Correctional Center, and then somehow he managed to escape. Uh, how did he do that? It's absolutely incredible how he did this. Um, he, he noticed one day that there was a, a radiator grill that he could unscrew with the tip of his nail clippers. And starting from that, he noticed that behind his radiator grill was an outside wall. But in order to get to that outside wall, he had to get through a, a metal sheet. In order to get through that metal sheet, he needed to find tools. So he did, he, he found the tools and he started to dig and he dig, dug and he dug and he dug for months on end. All of this fortunately just out of sight of the, uh, the prison security cameras and at the far end of the hallway from where the guard station was so that he could do this night after night. And when he got out, what did he do? Well, he wasn't quite sure what to do. You know, when he broke out, he, people wondered, would he go, uh, go south, go to Mexico, never, never return, never be heard from again? But of course, he went back to the streets of Winnipeg, where he was most famous and where he was celebrated as a kind of Robin Hood figure for executing this escape. And he lasted on the run for quite a while. Three weeks, I think. Three weeks. The most wanted man in Canada. Mm -hmm. Lasted for three weeks on the streets and nobody, I, nobody turned him in, nobody found him. How did no. they eventually get him? Uh, eventually, they, they obviously were putting a fair bit of effort into finding him, and they were monitoring the people he was in contact with. Uh, they caught up to him in the north end, the old stomping ground of the Indian Posse, where you know, his name, I think, rang out as though he were you know, the boss. And uh, they caught up to him, uh, pulling into a gas station, pulled him over, and that was the end of that. Hmm. There was a moment, I'm trying to recall in the book, uh, perhaps it was the interrogation uh, with the police officer, Lorat, I think was his name? That's right. Um, at which time, Danny basically forecasts how he expects to die. Mm. And that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. How did he die? This was in uh, January 2010 at the, the Federal Penitentiary in Prince Albert. Danny never had liked that place, and in fact, he had been on the phone with Susan not too long before, saying that there was a lot of tension in the prison, and uh, it just didn't feel right to him. Um, they went into the lunchroom around noon, and uh, a couple other guys were off in the middle of the room. Danny was off to one side, and all of a sudden, an attack broke out, targeting two of his fellow Indian Posse members. And Danny had been housed on a range that was supposed to be friendly to him. There were members of a gang that had a kind of alliance with the Indian Posse. And the, the fight basically broke down as this other gang versus the Indian Posse. And Danny wasn't their target. They had no intention of hurting Danny. But when he tried to intervene to stick up for his friends, someone waved a knife in his direction as though telling him to stay back. And he was hit just very, very shallow. Uh, but it was enough that uh, it got something crucial. I think it was an artery. Uh, and he sort of stumbled back, and he sat down, took a sip of his coffee, and slid to the floor, and that was the last of Danny Wolf. How old was he? 33. 33. Susan, how did you get the news that Danny had been killed in prison? I got it through um, one of the priests in there, or what do you call them, ministers, or mm -hmm. one of them anyway. Uh, he phoned me at my office on Okanese. This was about um, 3 o'clock, 3.30, and they told me that he passed away. And I didn't ask how or, or 
anything like that. I it just it, I just went into shock and I just couldn't answer any ask any questions or. He just tried to keep me on the phone as long as he could and to see if I was okay, but I just wanted to hang up and run, run, mm -hmm. run to my chief and run to our counselors there. Susan, given the kind of life Danny had, did you think it was pretty much inevitable that he would come to a violent end in jail? Well, I was, I was thinking about that, and just like I had this feeling that his life will be taken in jail because of what he was doing on the outside. Mm. Of what he did is hurting people. So that's a, that when my feeling came true. Susan, what is your favorite memory of Danny? Uh, my favorite memory is when we went up to a conference that was in Prince Albert and he was, he come with me. And we were, um, just me and him were driving in a car and we slept in a tent and went to the conference and we ate together. And our way coming home, we were talking, taking pictures. That I remember him as Danny, my son. Sort of a nice, normal mother-son day. Yes, yes it was. There weren't enough of those, were there, Susan? No, there was not. I want to share some more information with our audience right now, and this is courtesy of Howard Sapers, who is the correctional investigator uh, for Canada. The crime rate in Canada is at a 45-year low. The number of white adults entering prison has been declining for the last decade, but the indigenous incarceration rate is very much on the rise. Although they represent only 4.3% of Canada's population, almost a quarter of the current total inmate population in our prisons is Aboriginal. Compared to non-Aboriginal offenders, Aboriginal inmates are younger, they are less educated, they are more likely to be incarcerated for a violent offense, gang-affiliated, more likely to have a history of substance abuse and mental health concerns and backgrounds of domestic or physical abuse. They are overrepresented in segregation and maximum security populations and are more likely to return to custody uh, due to a new offense or revocation of parole. Uh, Joe, again, we got to get into this some more here. The incarceration rate for Indigenous adults in this country is thought to be 10 times higher than that of non-Aboriginal Canadians. Uh, we've talked about some of the reasons for that today, but go ahead, put, put some more on that if you would. Well, the number is just staggering. I mean, you, you can almost hardly believe it when you hear it. Um, I think a lot of this, if, if you look closely, is concentrated in the prairies. Uh, and what you're seeing is people going back into prison often, one sentence after another sentence. As you mentioned, parole rev revocation is a big issue here. Um, but essentially it comes down to the intergenerational trauma, the residential schools, the poverty in which these families are growing up, and the lack of opportunity that I think many young people have. How do we break that cycle? It's a very difficult question. Probably you know, the most important and most difficult question our country faces, I think. Um, you have to have a better education system. You have to you know, provide more funding for programs for these kids. Uh, and you've got to make sure that they, they have something that they can see themselves becoming one day. Susan, let me get your view on that. How do we break this, uh, what seems to be endless cycle, over and over and over again of Canada's indigenous population being overrepresented in our prisons? Um, well, there has to be some program of, um, or programs of, of our, our traditional ways and and we gotta like I'm not the only mother that has that has uh, children in gangs. Like there has like the parents have to step up and say, "Hey, I I want my my child out of this gang, and what do I need to do?" And you know, talk to your children about it. But if there is more programs out there for for self-esteem. Um, what do you call the life skills? That that will help our people a lot hmm. in well, learning their identity and learning learning our traditional ways. Susan, was were there ever any moments where you were able to say to your kids, uh, Danny or Richard or any of the others, look, th th this th there's got to be a better way. You, you've got to change the way you're living your life. Did you ever have a moment like that? 
Uh, no, I, I never ever told my children that because I didn't, I felt uh, useless myself. I like, nobody cared about me. I was switched from foster home to foster. I was raised in residential school and I was made a ward of the government and things were happening to me too that I, I didn't even care about. And, I, and what was I to say to them about that? Like, how, how was I supposed to say, um, change your life around? Now, do you still have one child in jail? I think Preston is still in jail? Yep, he just got sentenced to one year. And um, yeah, he's, him too, he's um, following that cycle of being in prison. I'm trying to teach him how to, um, be understand life to understand where where for him to understand life that like you know to enjoy life to ha to enjoy his children to walk on that red road and, and to be himself i guess hmm. because i can't do anything for him he needs to do that for himself I can't change his life. He's old, old enough now to learn to help himself. Uh, th there was almost a point, I think, uh, Joe, the way you described it, where there was an incentive to be in jail for some members of the Indian Posse. How, mm -hmm. how was that? Uh, the Indian Posse decided at, at one point uh, that they wanted to encourage people to, to get into the, the, the federal prison system in order to rise in the gang. So they made that a requirement for what they would call a full patch membership, to rise to the highest levels. Um, and that was in some ways a bit clever because what it did was it, the Indian Posse wanted to make a name for itself by being willing to do any, everything other gangs weren't. They were over the top with their violence. They were over the top with the risks they took. Um, so taking a risk that would land you in prison was not seen as a bad thing in the gang. It was seen as a good thing. And in fact, if you wanted to move up, it was something you needed to do. I want to ask you one last question, then I'm going to ask Susan a couple of last questions. The question I have for you is I got to the end of your book and I just thought, uh, these kids are born behind the eight ball, they've got terrible lives, and then they die prematurely. Like, it's just tragedy from, from you know, beginning to end. Mm. Uh, How did you write this book without yourself just wanting to throw your hands up and say, this is hopeless? Um, for me, what drove me through this process was that I was so interested to find out what had happened here. You know, I grew up in Winnipeg. I knew the Indian Posse when I was young. I heard about Danny Wolf for the first time after he led this breakout, and I thought to myself, this is a person who is a leader, was clearly capable of some pretty uh, unusual things. How did it come to be that he wanted to focus all his energy on this gang, a gang that when I learned a little more about it, was fairly clearly uh, directed against the aims of Canadian society. That was you know, basically an act of resistance le leading this gang. So I just wanted to understand more about that, and uh, telling this story has been so revealing and so fascinating to me that the hopelessness, the, you know, I don't, I don't feel that sense of hopelessness. I think if we understand, we can do something about it. Okay, good, because we do understand a whole lot better because you wrote this book. Terrific, a terrific read. Susan, my last questions for you are, uh, Danny had kids. Are you in touch with his children? Uh, just one, his uh, son. And how old is the son? 18. I think he's... Okay, and what, mm -hmm. what hopes do you have for Danny's children? Well, I hope they finish school, for one thing, and when they read about their dad, I hope they can understand him more, that um, what, his, what, what their dad went through, and to understand, like, if they have any questions, they could come and ask me. And I'm just um, thankful that um, his son has a good mom, that she's um, doing what a parent should do with a, with a child. Hmm. Do you ever fear that the kids are gonna follow in their father's footsteps? No, no, I don't. How come? I know that my, son, my grandson has a loving and caring mom that really cares for him and loves him dearly. That and she doesn't use drugs or alcohol. And she's, re she's really uh, a mother. I'm so glad that both of you could spend so much time with us tonight on TVO. The book is called The Ballad of Danny Wolf, Life of a Modern Outlaw. Joe Friesen, the author, is with me here in studio. Susan Creeley, Danny's mother. 
uh, is in Regina, Saskatchewan. Uh, thanks so much to both of you for joining us on TVO tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.